With that being said, let's open our Bibles, finally, to 1 Peter. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing a study through 1 Peter. Uh, the theme of 1 Peter is living hope in Jesus Christ. Um, so, I encourage you guys to be following along in your Bibles, read during the week. Uh, we'll be in verses 1 through 9 this morning in 1 Peter. But I encourage you all week long to not only read the verses that we cover this week, but keep reading and, and really absorb everything in Peter's letter because it, it, it really comes at a, at a time in our own current situation in history in which uh, there is great persecution and suffering for the church and within the Christian li at our Christian lives, as you all well know. Um, and so this letter... Um, gives great cause for comfort because it gives a great explanation as to what this suffering is all about and uh, how God is working in it. Yes, God works in suffering. God allows suffering. Um, he works in and through it. So it's not something for us to um, always necessarily come to God in prayer and say, Lord, take this away. Uh, because in a lot of cases, it's what God is actually doing. We're going to find out from the Old Testament through some verses we'll share this morning that God has been working uh, in the history of the church and through his people and allowing suffering in their lives to purify their lives. So it's a big part of our Christian walk. We need to accept that. You won't hear that everywhere you go, but that is the truth, that God refines the believer in the fiery trials of life. And it's a good thing that God does it because without it, we would, be, we would live impure lives and that doesn't glorify God. So let's pray. We'll come to First Peter and be in verses 1 through 9. And um, I'm just going to ask this question at the outset before I pray. Do we, do, we real, do we truly know what it is like to suffer for our faith? Do we truly know what it is like to suffer for our faith? Father, Lord Jesus, <clears throat> I am just so grateful that as I stand before you this morning, I am in great need of your help, that your Holy Spirit would fill me First, with cleansing power, Lord. I am a sinner who needs to be cleansed and forgiven. I know that my brothers and sisters know that of themselves. So we come together as a body knowing that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We again claim the precious blood of Jesus. Father, thank you so much for that precious lamb that took away the sin of the world. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son, ultimately you on the cross for us. Father, we confess our sin to you and ask you to cleanse us now. We want your Holy Spirit to be unobstructed, that he would speak to us directly. Father, remove the distractions. For some of us, um, we're not feeling well this morning. That can certainly be a distraction, Lord, and I pray that you would just bring healing, even if it's, even if it's for a time, Lord, that we would not be distracted by it. Father, I pray that you would help those who've been uh, affected by the fiery dots of the enemy this morning, that you would protect them wherever they are, that you would, Father, show yourself greater than the enemy and free them. Free all of us, Lord. Let us live the glorified, purified Christian life that gives you glory in the end, Lord. Help us not, and I say this boldly, Lord, help us not as Christians to only see comfort. That we would want everything that's hard in our lives to be taken away. That instead we would allow you to have glory in the moment of our weakness. That your strength would show itself in us and bring glory to you, Lord. Help us to buy into that. Realize it. Live it. We need to, Lord. We need you to help us to realize that you're not a genie. You're our Savior. And you will meet us in every storm, in every valley of life. And that we never have to be afraid because you're with us. And we thank you for that, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we truly know what it is like to suffer for our faith? What a good question. Um, this might be Satan's greatest weapon is the modern church and its followers of Jesus Christ want to be comfortable. We want everything we think we need. 
And yet, do we really know what we need? Uh, it is not the comfortable life, a life that is not dependent or needful of God, that really glorifies God. In it is a lot of self-will, self-preservation, self-focus. Uh, the greatest times in, in my life when I've grown the most, and I've mentioned this to you before, is when I've suffered the greatest. It's when I became dependent on the Lord. From my own, you know, when, and the most wonderful, beautiful thing about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit helps me to know when I'm wrong. Amen. There was a time in my life when I didn't know I was wrong. I really didn't. I was living the most deplorable, abominable Christian life, and I didn't know I was wrong. And when the Holy Spirit came alive in my life, everything started to, became sensory to me. I knew when I was wrong. And it was more often than I wanted to admit. And I found myself constantly saying to the Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me, Lord. Thank you that I can see this now. That I'm not blind. That I'm not tricked by the enemy to thinking that, you know, because I did some good deed today, that I'm good enough. It is humbling as a believer to recognize that you need a Savior. And yet that is, was the biggest problem for the nation of Israel. They didn't know they needed a Savior. They had a religious, traditional pattern of being right with God. And yet that whole commandment that he gave them, the Old Testament, was designed not to be fulfilled in them. It was Jesus who would fulfill that. But they needed Jesus to do it because they could never. And so... It is, it is so important for us to recognize the need for God to purify our lives. You need to be purified. I need to be purified. And it's only through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that we even have any hope that that can happen. And that's the biggest part of what Peter will write in his letter. Um, he wrote in a time in which believers were in deep persecution, truly a persecution that in the United States, we have no clue. Really, truly, we have no clue. We may get a snicker from a boss because we say, you know, I have to have Sundays off, or we, we might get a, you know, when we say amen, or thank God, we might get a little, you know, a little rejection, but that pales in comparison to what the early church was going through in Peter's day. A little historical background to what, when Peter is writing now. He's writing in a time, and we believe he wrote this letter between A.D. 60 and A.D. 65, in a time in which the church was being persecuted greatly. The church had been uh, dispersed and scattered uh, after the day of Pentecost. Um, a lot of that happened because of Pharisaical attack, uh, but later it was the Romans who recognized Originally, the church was recognized as a Jewish sect that came out of Judaism. And, and Rome was okay with that because they seen the Jews, in a lot of respects, I think the way we see Pontius Pilate deal with the Sanhedrin, that they were like, really? Just nothing to be feared. They were a bunch of manipulators. And they didn't fear uh, the Jewish uh, church. But it was when Jesus came and powerful things started to happen in the church of Jesus Christ grew that this became a threat to the Roman Empire and it was very greatly misunderstood when it was talked about eating the body and drinking the blood of Jesus Christ you know the church was labeled as cannibalistic because they didn't even understand what communion was about they had no idea that that was about complete devotion to God and remembering that Jesus died for his people but they were labeled as fanatics and crazy people, but yet dangerous people because they were growing. And so the church was under deep persecution, and especially in, during Peter's time of writing this letter, letter Rome was under the rulership of Caesar Nero uh, during his reign, and this guy was a maniacal crazy man. Um, he thought nothing of throwing a party for his Roman leaders. And you know how he would light the party at nighttime? He would take a Christian, impale them, alive, 
he would dip them in tar and oil and he would light them on fire and he'd put that around the fire. Can you, can, can you, do you just, I want you to just think about how sick that is. And that was, and, and in the midst of it, they would laugh and dance and have fun. We're all dead Christians, we're all lighting the party. Um, Nero was, was obviously a powerful tool in Satan's hands. And uh, you see the actions of Nero as Satan attacking God's people. And yet God was in control of it all. God was in control of it all. And Peter's letter to the church at this time was needed so much to be an encouragement. Because in times of persecution and over long periods of time, and you and I have experienced it, you can grow hopeless. You can get to the point where you're like, it's never going to end. Satan's going to have his way until he beats me to a pulp and I just die. And we can get to that hopeless state. And yet, Peter's message, this letter, is a powerful message to be hopeful. That don't look at suffering as Satan's advantage and victory, but look at it as God's tool of refining believers' lives. The fiery trial you go through today is not God on break, <laughs> if you will, or taking a nap and Satan is having his way. Again, I find myself saying it every week, nothing that happens in your life can happen unless it passes through a sovereign God's hands first. He has to allow it. Satan cannot do what he wants. Job, and the story of Job, starting in chapter 1 of Job, and you should read it if you feel you're suffering, realize that Satan has to ask permission. He cannot do anything in this world without permission. God has to allow it. And if God will allow it, let's ask the motive, and it's fear. Why would God allow suffering? Because it can purify us. Let's jump into the letter. And it's a powerful one. Written at a time of deep persecution. I, I want to further mention something to you. Before I do. At this time, because Caesar Nero is such a deranged man. Power hungry. Thinking of building his own kingdom. What he's going to actually do in Rome. Is he wants to get rid of two thirds of Rome. He wants to rebuild it into a contemporary city. He's got a problem. He's got a lot of these old tenant, tenant buildings. And... and slums and, and deplorable areas in his kingdom and he doesn't he wants them gone. And so the government, you know, his leaders underneath him in the Senate, they don't he comes up with a plan, let's just get rid of all of that and let's just build it all new. But they don't want to do that. So mysteriously, I think it's the um, historian Tactus of that day recorded for us in history as he wrote about what happened in Rome in AD sixty four that mysteriously Caesar Nero is on vacation. He's out of Rome. And in the meantime, it was on July AD 64, Rome had this major fire which burned for three days and it destroyed a lot of the city. But the fire started to go out. They were fighting the fire and it started to cut off. But then mysteriously, it flamed back up and continued to burn, and burned for over 10 days. And when the fire was finally put out, two-thirds of Rome had burned down. Now, that worked right in Caesar Nero's favor, because he wanted it all gone anyways, and he couldn't get the Senate to go along with him, so a little, you know, arson, <laughs> if you will, by his hired minions, to come in and burn down the city so that he could rebuild it in honor of himself. And he wanted to call it the Neropolis. Neropolis. <laughs> and history tells us, and even to this day, there's, a, there's just no understanding as how two-thirds of Rome burnt down. Now, ironically, there was great uproar in Rome over how this happened. There were accusations towards Nero. And what do you think he used as a scapegoat? Christians. He said, it's those Christians. Those crazy people, those nuts. They burnt the city down. And what did that do to the Christians? 
they became even more persecuted. It's at this time that Peter writes this letter. And listen to what he says in verse 1 of 1 Peter 1. This letter is from Peter. We need, so now we know <laughs> this letter is from Peter. An apostle, which means simply a sent one, of Jesus Christ. Now, as Peter writes this letter, let, let's rewind a little bit. Who's Peter? Peter is that profane fisherman who God said, Jesus said to him, you're no longer going to be a fisher of, in the way that you are. You're going to become a fisher of men. He receives the calling of God upon his life to become a disciple. He follows the Savior. Unfortunately, we know what happens before Christ's crucifixion. It is Peter who denies the Lord three times. And what a beautiful picture. Here he is now Holy Spiritly inspired to write that he is Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful <laughs> excuse me. What a beautiful thing for us to examine about ourselves. When I look at Peter, now an apostle writing this letter, and think about his failure and what he did in, in um, denying the Lord in such a horrible way, was that God, God can use failures. I know that in my own life, he, I was a big failure for the Lord, but that didn't stop him from using me. Some of us disqualify ourselves and we don't recognize that God can use us in our brokenness, in our fleshliness, in our carnality. God can, can break a chain, a woman, a man, and he can make us new. And that's what I believe is the spirit of how Peter writes this letter. He knows what it felt like to be in the fire. It was the fire of denial, the fire of fear that kept Peter from being everything that God wanted him to be, and yet the Lord put him through the fire to purify him. And I'll be honest with you, I believe that fire was the hottest in his life after he denied the Lord the third time. And the Bible accounts for us that he looked into the eyes of Jesus. And the, the fierce flame that must have stoked of, of pain, knowing, I've let you down, Lord. I'm the one who said, I'll go to death even for you, Lord. And here I am, this coward who has let you down. And what a beautiful inspiration to us that if God can do that in Peter's life, he can do it in your life. Amen? He can do it in my life. God can use broken people. God can use failed women and ladies for his glories. But this, these words reveal the powerful grace and mercy and love of Jesus Christ. Peter was chosen by God to show God can use failures. It says here, as we continue, I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. And his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. His two realities concerning your salvation that are revealed. Number one, God chose you long ago ago in his love. God chose you. Yeah. Number two, you obeyed him. Now, I want you to see that the doctrine of election presented here. This is the foreknowledge of God choosing his people. This can cause a lot of consternation and fear and anxiety when people read this. They say, well, that's not fair. That means that God only chooses certain people, and what about the people he doesn't choose? He makes them to, to, to condemn them and kill them? What kind of a God is that? Well, there are two views. The Calvinistic view is that your salvation, it was all of God. You had nothing to do with it. The Arminian view is that you chose. God presented a way of salvation, and it was all up to you to choose. I'm one that falls in the belief that both are true. That God chose you before the foundation of the world in love to be with, him, be with him forever. I based it on the scripture that says that God wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants all to be saved. I don't believe God makes anyone to be judged and put to death because of their rebellion. I don't believe God's God's intention. But he does leave and he does give us all the ability to understand and know who he is and it's only in a willful rebellious act 
in the spite of God relentlessly giving us chance after chance after chance, open door opportunity, all the way up to the last breath, that the only way we can ever be rejected is that we have to reject him. That there's a door that says, I've chosen you in love to come and be with me yet forever. And we have to walk through that door. And as we walk through that door, we turn around and look at the other sign on the other side and it says, you are the called of God, the chosen of God. See, you can't see the second sign until you make a decision to walk through the door. And many will choose not to. Many this morning, that door is open to them, but they will not choose to walk through it. I want to share with you a comment from uh, Pastor David Jeremiah. This is what he said. Christians are chosen for salvation by God the Father, not because of who they are, what they have done, or what they might do because of his endless grace and compassion. This is the doctrine of election. Election does not mean that God is a mean overlord who chooses some and rejects others. Nor does it cancel out human responsibility, making us mere puppets. God's choosing demonstrates his grace. But in election, we must still choose to trust in Christ. And we respond to God's choosing by choosing to live holy lives. An old story about election demonstrates God's heart. A man was walking through a doorway, and above the entrance was a sign that read, Whosoever will come, whosoever will may come. And as he walked through the doorway, he looked back, and another sign above the entrance on the side read, I choose you before the foundation of the world created. That's a better uh, explanation than I gave. But that's what I do believe is the authentic doctrine of election and man's responsibility in the Bible. I think it really speaks of God's love. I just cannot imagine that God would purposely create any human being so that he can condemn them and kill them. It just does not wash with anything that I know of God. So there's this reality that we respond to God's choosing. And then Peter wrote, May God give you more and more grace and peace. This happens walking in a relationship with God. It's so important for us to be in a relationship with God. A daily communication with God. Where every circumstance in, that we go through, we, we're in relationship with God. That we're in constant communion with Him. That everything we go through, everything we experience, we're in communion and in, in contact with God about Truly the growing Christian experience is grounded in seeing God's grace applied over and over again in our lives. Experiencing that unearned favor of God magnifies the love he has for us. This is the peace we treasure. I know without the grace of God in my life over and over and more and more, I wouldn't be able to continue to be in a relationship with God. I would condemn myself. I would be, I would feel hopeless. Understanding that there's more and more grace available to you as we walk in relationship to God is recognizing that God is going to bring us along until that day we're with him. Amen. That he's going to purify us. That he has a plan. He's not leaving us out there to say, well, figure it out, kid. I'll see you at the end of the race. No, he joins us in the race of life. Amen. And he helps us. Look what it says in verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again, made new. Because, why? Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. This is our living hope. And we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Now, I want to ask you a question because I know there's a very popular book out there. If you've been in the airport or any bookstore, you constantly see a book that says your best life now. 
Well, I want to ask a question. How can you have your best life now if your inheritance is kept in heaven for you? In other words, if there's an inheritance from God Almighty in heaven, which is ultimately the fulfillment of your salvation in Jesus Christ, if that's waiting for you, how could you possibly compare what you'd experience now in this life to be greater? How can it be the best life you're going to have? No. If there's something, inheritance in heaven waiting for us, in comparison, we know there's something much greater waiting for us, better for us, higher for us, in comparison to that, really, truly, this is the worst life. <laughs> right? It's our worst life now. Can you imagine if we think of it the other way? If we think that our best life is now then we're not going to want to go to heaven. We're not. If this is the best, then there's something less waiting for us. Do you understand? Do you, do you, do you see the, f the fault in that kind of reasoning, that way of thinking? And yet, that's what the world wants to hear. The world wants to hear that I can get the best of what life has to offer now in the way of health and wealth I can get that now. Now, don't misunderstand me. Because I can pay all my bills and I, and I have a beautiful home God gave me. I have an automobile outside that runs and drives perfectly for me right now. I have health right now. I have a blessed life right now is what I'm saying to you. But there is a far greater blessing coming for me. And that's the better life. That's the best life I'm waiting to go to. This life, as long as Satan is on the scene, can never be my best life. It's going to be a life that's attacked. <laughs> and this is the message. This is where Peter, through his letter, is trying to instill hope in them because they're, they're being tortured. They're being put to death. Some of their comrades in Christianity are being lit on fire. As a whim of, of an evil man, Caesar Nero. And, and the Roman Empire is far reaching in everywhere that they are. They're up in northern Turkey right now as they've been dispersed, <coughs> running away from Rome. <coughs> They're in constant persecution. Reminds me of the churches that exist in Korea and the churches that exist in China and in other places of the world in which you could be put to death. For, for the, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. <coughs> you could be lit on fire. Think about what happened as ISIS ransacked and killed Christians in Iran. <coughs> People in Iraq, they were lit on, put in cages and lit on fire. That's persecution. It pales in comparison to what the Christian goes on, goes through today. <coughs> Excuse me. Peter now tells them the truth about the future. Truly, no pain, no gain has a ring of spiritual truth to it. <coughs> Excuse me. Look what it says here in verse 6. So be truly glad. We like that. There is wonderful joy ahead. We like that too. But then he says this, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. I have some water, honey. I appreciate that. Thank you, though. <coughs> there is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Those, those words, a little while, are, are key to Peter's letter. Verse 7, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. Did you hear that? These trials will show that your faith is genuine. When you say you're a Christian and life is good and you've got a big smile on your face, you, look, you make Christianity look real good. But then when it's tested, that you believe that God said he'd never leave you or forsake you and that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we're put in the fire, can we still stand? <coughs> That's the test. Can we still stay in the faith? Can we say to people that, yes, I'm going through this. 
But I know that God loves me. And that he's going to take me through this. That's when the world is impressed. That's when God is glorified. So, is it important for a Christian to endure trials? Yes, it is. It is. It's very important. It's not something we should run through. Run from. The Bible tells us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials. That God, Satan wants to use those things to destroy us and to de-legitimize de um, the Christian walk. But God wants to use them to bring him glory. And so, as Christians, we realize these words, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It, your faith is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through these trials, amen? amen? So when your faith remains strong through these trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. This is called the refiner's fire. Did Peter know what it felt like to go through the refiner's fire? Yes, he did. Peter was well aware and he was trying to tell them, I know how you feel. I know the fear you feel. I'm, I'm, fear, I'm, I'm under that same fear right now. I'm under that attack. I went through a horrible attack when I rejected the Lord. But God brought me through the fire. God brought me through the fire. I was remembering from Daniel 3, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Everyone remember them? King Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to bow down to his statue. And they said, we, we're just not going to do that, king. And even if you, even if God doesn't deliver us, we still won't bow to you Amen. in your, your temple. We won't. And what happened? In his haste, he had them stoke that fire. More powerful than it ever was. And it was so hot that the gods who threw them in, they were consumed by the flames. And they were thrown in the fire. And it was Nebuchadnezzar's testimony that when he looked in the fire, he said, didn't we throw three people in there? But there's four and there's one that looks like the Son of Man. Isn't that the truth? Do you remember through your Christian experiences when you've been through the hottest times? Did you feel Jesus with you? I did. And my only explanation for how I got through those times of trial was the fact that God was with me. That he did love me. And he proved my own faith. And didn't even ask me to do it by myself. He was there to encourage me. He was that coach. Who just walked with me and said. Keep going Darren. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. I love you. I love you. I have a plan. I have a plan. Don't give up. Don't run from that fire. Peter was aware that and knew that they were going through great persecution. But the great time of fiery trial was coming. We believe as Peter wrote this letter that Rome hadn't been put on fire yet. And the aftermath of that fire was that Christians would be persecuted greatly because they would be blamed for it. And Peter, believe Holy and Spirit inspired, prophetically wrote this letter to them saying, it's going to get hotter. As hot as it is, it's going to get hotter. And I really believe that's a message to the church today. It's going to get hotter. We've never really known true persecution in the United States, but it's coming. It's coming. When I think about the liberal agenda today, and I'm not going to talk about politics, but when I hear about them now pressing abortion, late term, after a child's born, that they want to start killing babies while they're alive, and, and no one kicking back on that side. Nobody's saying, wait a minute, no, 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 that's not what we're really about. And the lust for power. It is a satanic idea that God is okay with us killing ourselves for convenience. How could we? What a self-destruct button in a woman's life when that poor woman is manipulated and they think they're courageous and they take a life and the wound of that decision lingers with them forever. And they're tricked into thinking 
that it won't always be this way. You, you'll get over it. Life will go on. What a horrible, evil thing that Satan is doing in our world today. And the persecution, God won't... God's going to judge the great tribulation. See, there's suffering today. And that's part of the Christian life. And that's something that purifies us. But the great tribulation, the tribulation we go through now, pales in comparison to when the wrath of God will pour out upon the world. But the Bible teaches us that we will be shielded and saved from that wrath of God and be taken up with Him before He unleashes the wrath upon a rebellious world. But listen to this. Here's a powerful truth. When our faith stands firm in times of trial, it brings glory to God. So you can rejoice. Because trial strengthens faith. Trial strengthens faith. Notice the words a little while. He says you're going to endure trials for a little while. Satan's lie is that you're going to be annihilated in this hopelessness, in this suffering. It's never going to end. That's a lie. A lot of our suffering that we go through today is only for a season. It's going to end. Amen? It's going to end. Whatever you're going through today, don't let Satan think, oh, this is it. Going down a dark black hole that leads to death. It's only for a season when God is in control. He's using it to refine you. He's testing you. Stand firm in your faith and trust. No matter what you have to endure, stand firm and say, no matter what I have to go. Job said, naked I came into the world, naked I'll leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Naked I came into the world. Naked I'll leave. Have your way, Lord. Your God. You made me. It's up to you. Do whatever you need to do with me. Bless your name. I will not let Satan have victory. What a victory he gave Jesus. What a victory he gave God in that day. I want to meet Job when I get to heaven. He's the first one I want to step up and give him a big hug. Thank you, Job. You gave me a path of how to bring glory to God. Take what you want, Satan. But you can't have my love for God. You can't have the truth I know in Jesus Christ. No matter what I suffer, I never suffered what my Savior suffered on the cross. Nor will I ever have to. <clears throat> Job 23.10 Let's look at that. Job 23.10 But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. That's what God wants to do. You know, I'm a plumber. You guys know that. When we're going to pour a lead joint, it's an old way of plumbing that's kind of going away, but we still do some repair. And we, we take lead, and we put it into a ladle, and we take a hot acetylene torch, and we heat that up to over 800 degrees. And once it gets to that temperature, it solidifies. It goes from a solid lead to liquid. And what happens as we heat that more and more and stir it, all the impurities come to the top. And we take a, a, a screwdriver or something and we, we get rid of all the junk. We get rid of all the junk. And we get it to a point where we can actually see a mirror image. And then we know, now that all the impurities are out that could cause a leak, we're ready to pour that joint. And it will, it will encapsulate the joint and then it will, so it will harden and we pack the joint, and now it's a sealed joint. But it's not until, and I love how somebody said this many years ago, it's not till we can see our own image that we can, and it's truly, it's Jesus Christ, the image of Christ in ourselves, that we are really ready to glorify God. But we've got to let that fire come. We have to embrace it. We can't be afraid of it. We can't ask God to take it away. We just ask us, Lord, take us through it. Take us through it. Let me wrap up. In verse 8, you love him even though you have not seen him. That's faith. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Let me end with this. I want to share something from uh, John Corson on this scripture. He, 
he wrote this story. You go to the United Airlines counter at the airport and the ticket agent says, your flight to San Francisco is on, oh, I can't even read it, is <laughs> on time, I believe. Oh, uh, okay. Your flight to San Francisco is on time. There's been some turbulence, but absolutely guarantee that you'll get there. Our plane is in great shape. Our pilot is fully qualified. You might experience a bump or two, but you're going to get there just fine. Hang on to my ticket, you say, as you make your way to the different ticket counter. And there, and you ask, are there any available seats on the flight to San Francisco, you ask. You bet, says the agent, and we guarantee you'll have a smooth ride. No bumps, no jolts, no air sickness. Guaranteed smooth sailing all the way. It's the landing we're not so sure about. You see, our landing gear is not working quite right, and we seem to have a problem with occasionally landing nose first. Also, the brakes haven't been serviced recently, but we guarantee the flight will be smooth, even if the landing is a little iffy. If you have to choose between a smooth flight with a crash landing or a bumpy flight with a safe landing, you no doubt opt for the bumpy flight. There are those who say, I don't want trials. I don't want to go through go against the world system. I don't want to deal with all those church disciplines in, you talk about. I just want smooth sailing. They are fools. For although they might escape a bump or two presently, they're ultimately headed for a fiery crash landing. On the other hand, those of us who presently deal with a bump or two along the way will make a safe landing in heaven. Amen? Amen. Isn't that the truth? I, I read that and I said, oh, that's good. That's good stuff. Let me share it with our congregation. Jesus, our Savior's resurrection life, is our living hope. We look and we see the same way, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us as we sing that song. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. The resurrection power of God that raised Jesus from the dead will raise us and we will be with him forever. In a place where there's no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow, and no more death. God is good. Let's take this truth with us home today. Let it encourage us. Let us fill, with, fill us with hopefulness, as Paul intended as he wrote to the early church, and now we read and are inspired. Let's bow our heads. Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the truth of your word, which refreshes us and reminds us <coughs> that the fiery trial we go through today is nothing compared to the glory and the peace and the love that we will enjoy with you forever. Father, help us to reject a desire for ease of life and comfort and recognize that that was never your plan as you called us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow you, that it was a life of battle but a life of victory as you take us through from glory to glory. Father, Bless each and every one here this morning. Lord, I don't know specific instances or what everyone's going through, Lord, but I do know that whatever they're going through, you can bring them through it and you can be glorified in it. So I pray, Lord, that we would apprehend this truth and live it out. Help us, Lord, to do that so that the world can see that our faith is real and that it comes through the fiery trial tested and approved. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys and have a wonderful Sunday.